Hello, welcome back to Oral Surgery Journal Club. I'd like to share with you all today a very classic paper. This paper comes from Dr. William Bell, and it was published all the way back in 1975. Now, here's just a picture of Dr. William Bell. He is considered a pioneer in the field of oral maxillofacial surgery. He spent many years both as a professor as well as developing advanced research into the fields of specifically of bone healing and Lefort 1 osteotomy, which we're going to be talking about today, as well as distraction osteogenesis. So, a quick synopsis of this paper and why it's so classic. This paper is largely credited as providing the biological basis and the evidence for the surgery that we commonly perform today, the Lefort 1. Before this paper, just to get a little historical perspective, there there were some, there were all sorts of various techniques advocated at the time. There was not an accepted technique, and there was certainly a great concern with freely mobilizing the maxilla in terms of could it tolerate the vascular compromise that it would in involve, and was this, was this a safe surgery? So what Dr. William Bell did is he took 12 monkeys, and he performed the Lefort 1 osteotomy as described as we do it to this day. And then he took the monkeys, he injected radio contrast, and slaughtered them at various time points a few weeks or a few days after the surgery. And he was able to look at both the intraosseous and the intrapulpal components of the maxilla to look for signs of ischemia or pulp vitality. And he was able to demonstrate, although there was a very transient ischemia, there was certainly no necrosis, and he provided the safety evidence that this procedure that we do to this day is completely safe. So that's the quick synopsis. Now, there's really a lot to talk about in this paper, so I'm going to go through it a little bit slower with the, getting into all the details and the nitty-gritty. And I think the first place to start with is a little bit of the history, just to gain perspective of where, why this paper is so foundational as, as when you appreciate it in its time. So prior to this paper coming out, there were all sorts of different techniques being advocated. And even in this paper, he mentions back in 1927, Wassmans was the first one to advocate doing the total maxillary osteotomy, the total before it won. Prior to that, people were only doing uh, components or portions, of, like a segmental, but they were not doing the entire maxilla. Um, then, even in the 20s, when Wassman introduced it, he certainly, even though he was doing a total maxillary osteotomy, he was not mobilizing the maxilla. There was great concern about involving disjoining the pterygo maxillary disjunction, of course, because of all the bleeding, and as well as whether the, the vascular supply could tolerate that, that osteotomy and that disjunction. So at the time, there were different authors advocating it, and it was done through various approaches, whether it was done through the buckle, or it was done through the palatal, or a combination of the, of the two. And of course, when it was done through different techniques, it was found to be very unstable, and of course involved great vascular compromise, and often had complications of necrosis. Then, in 1965, um, Obi Gazer was the first one who recommended actually doing the complete uh, Lefort 1 osteotomy with complete mobilization. And that was very novel in the time because everyone was very concerned about the complete mobilization like the way we do it today, where we not only down fracture the maxilla, but it's just dangling pedicles to very little soft tissue. If you think about after we down fracture the maxilla, the entire blood supply is, re is resultant on just the remaining soft tissue of the palate and the very posterior buccal labial vestibule. And so that's the entire blood supply, and we take that for granted, but obviously in the time period, that was considered very scary to do so. So this surgery, given that historical, um, given that historical perspective, that's where Dr. William Bell came to provide the evidence for this. So again, in 65, Obi Gazer did recommend doing the osteotomy that we do to this day via a wide vestibular incision but by no means was it an accepted surgery. And then in 1975, when Dr. William Bell performed this study, he provided the basis saying, hey, look, I've done this study. I've proven that it is safe. And thereafter, after this study, it was widely accepted. And to this day, the surgery that we're going to describe in this paper is actually very similar to the surgery that we do to this day. So that's the historical background. Getting to the actual study, he took 12 Reese's monkeys, now it's interesting, these monkeys actually were fairly small. They were only 10 kilograms, and he describes his incision very similar, like I said, to what we do to this day. He made an incision going through the mucoperiosteum, extending from one tuberosity to the other, and the maxilla pedicle was pedicled to just the palatal mucosa and the buccal labial gingiva, just like we do to this day. So he did a complete Lefort 1 osteotomy through a wide vestibular incision without obviously violating the palate. So here's some pictures of these are the monkeys and these are the surgeries and obviously you can tell this looks very much like what we do to this day. Then after the surgery he took the animals and he injected 
um, radio contrast, and he was able to expose them. We'll actually get into that because I found that very interesting. So two of the animals he didn't operate on, they just served as controls. Seven animals, they tried to, they at least in theory attempted to spare the greater palatine arteries, and they killed the animals at following intervals immediately after the surgery, two days, and then one, two, four, six, and 12 weeks after the surgery. And then three of the animals, so two animals were controlled, 10 animals were operated on, seven, they preserved the arteries, three, they actually sacrificed the greater palatine, and then they killed those animals at immediately after the surgery, four weeks after, and six weeks after. So we have those 12 animals, and I found this so interesting. So just to put it in perspective, what they did was basically like a primitive version of a T CT scan. And I looked up the history, because I was wondering, you know, should this be much easier to do a CT scan? So believe it or not, the first CT scan was just brought by, was bought by Mayo Clinic in 1973. It had been developed a year prior in England. And 1973 was when Mayo Clinic introduced the first CT scan in America. So obviously when this paper came out in 1975, there was no CT scan. So you have to appreciate what the heroic efforts they had to go through. So this is exactly what they described. They injected animals with this radio contrast through the carotids, and then they uh, disarticulated the head, guillotine chopped it off, they dropped it in formalin, and then they used this microtome to section the head into one millimeter sections, kind of like a, a deli slicer. They used this microtome and they coronally chopped up the head and they were able to do it so fine that the, each slice could only be a millimeter. Then they exposed these patients to basically a plain film and the result is actually what looks like a very amazing CT scan. These are one millimeter thickness and these are coronal views and you could really appreciate the clarity of the of these plain films that were previously injected with contrast and then sectioned with a microtome. All right, so getting to the results. The results are fascinating, and not only for what we can learn about on the Fort One, but also I found it interesting for a couple of other things, just to appreciate the, the process of bone healing and for reanastomosis and revascularization. So we'll get to all that actually as we go through it. So the control animals, as you would expect, the control animals did not have surgery. There was no Lefort 1 done. Their maxilla was intact. So there was generalized distribution of the radio contrast throughout the intraosseous, the intrapulpal, and the soft tissue blood vessels. Of course, as you would expect. All right, now the remaining 10 animals. So immediately, and two-day animals. So I do have to mention this. They did inadvertently section the long maxillary canine roots. So one quite interesting difference between the monkeys and us is their canines. I mean, our canines are long, but these monkeys must have been extraordinarily long because in all 10 of the animals, they inadvertently sectioned these canines. I guess it was unavoidable. My guess is these, these canines went quite above the piriform aperture and there was just no way to avoid it. And so they did, unfortunately, section the canines. So as you would expect, there was no vitality to be found in the canines. Does that compromise the study? No, not really, because as long as the incisors were fine, then we could assume the canines would have been fine had they not been sectioned. So anyway, so they're looking at all the maxillary teeth and they found the injection medium was well distributed throughout the pulp canals of all the maxillary teeth besides for the canines like we just mentioned. There were focal areas of intraosseous ischemia, so not in the teeth. The teeth were vital, but there was focal areas of intraosseous ischemia, um, and we're going to look at that compared to other time points. Again, right now we're just talking about immediately after and two days after the surgery. So again, some focal areas of intraosseous ischemia, but the teeth are vital. In terms of the flaps, I found this so interesting. I mean, I'm really glad that they described in this paper because this is a separate question that I always had when it came to doing like a ridge split. When you lay a flap, how long does it take to reanastomose and revascularize the flap? So I'm going to take, be taking a look at this as he describes it over the various time courses. So immediately after the surgery, the flaps were separated from the underlying bone by a large avascular space, as you might expect, right? It doesn't quickly re reattach. So immediately after, you're seeing this this dead space essentially, and they were seeing some extra some some avascular areas directly underneath the flaps. Now compare that to the one week specimen. So within one week, now all of a sudden you're seeing some significant changes. So the previously raised soft tissue flaps, now actually they were well vascularized, but they were still were not attached to the bone. So now you're seeing some edema, you're seeing some vascularization, but again, they're not adhering to the bone. What else are we seeing at one week? Um, interesting. The, the space between the fragments of bone, so between the osteotomies, you're starting to see the, the process of a callus form. You're seeing young granulation tissue composed of immature fibroblasts and young capillaries. So you're seeing the, the process of neovascularization between the osteotomies. 
All right, now compare that to two weeks. Two weeks, you can continue the development, and at this point, you're seeing well-distributed uh, contrast throughout the bone and the pulp of all the teeth, except, of course, the canines, like we mentioned, so great. It was it was it was well distributed immediately after the surgery, and nothing changed. Two weeks later, it was even better. Vibrant teeth, vibrant bone. There's no longer any areas of focal ischemia like we saw immediately after two weeks. Everything looks beautiful. In terms of the flap, there was a thickened labial buckle and nasal mucoparousal flaps. So all the flaps at this point were thickened, they were vascularized, and they were actually reattached to the bone in most areas. So by two weeks, the flap started to be reattached. Uh, moving on. In terms of between the osteotomies, remember we talked about the callus? So there was some circulation, uh, there was some proliferating endosteal blood vessels, so you're starting to see the process of neovascularization even more profound. There's the microscopic appearance of callus. Um, so the first week there was just fibrous connective tissue. At this point it's more mature connective tissue, but still it doesn't look like bone yet. So at two weeks we're seeing a callus form made up of dense fibrous connective tissue, but still not osteoid yet. At four weeks, at this point we're seeing a thickened perfused blood vessels in the gingiva. So at this point the flaps actually look fantastic. The, the, remember, at two weeks they had reattached to the bone, but they weren't, weren't quite reanastomosed yet. So at four weeks, the, the, the flaps were fully thickened. They were, they were, there were blood supply penetrated and traversed the bone, and they were reattached to the bone, like we said already, at two weeks. And they were anastomosed with the periodontal plexus. So now you're seeing con continuity of the blood supply from one end of the flap to the other. So that's very significant. So I think if my question was, in terms of a ridge split, when you lay a flap, how long does it take to reestablish the blood supply? I'd say at two weeks you're seeing the early start of neovascularization, but I'd say the continuity of the blood vessels probably by four weeks would be well established at that point. In terms of the callus between the osseous segments, so here actually at four weeks you're starting to see young bone. You're starting to see active osteoblastic activity and you're seeing osteoid being formed. So as compared to two weeks where there was just connective tissue, finally at four weeks you're seeing bone. Now I found that also interesting. I know this is not necessarily related to the floor, but things that I like to think about tangentially. So um, if you guys recall, remember in the, the Emrange position paper they talked to, you know, if you want to look it up, there was a mention about waiting for what's the, how long should you wait till after an extraction before you resume um, uh, bisphosphonates, and they said either mucalization or early osseous healing. And that phrase, I was kind of left wondering, well, what exactly does that mean, early osseous healing? It's kind of vague. Well, based on this paper, I suspected it's somewhere around four weeks, maybe, because that's what we're seeing. Around four weeks, you're seeing early active uh, osteoblastic activity and osteoid bone being formed at four weeks. Anyway, that's just something I found interesting. Moving on, along with the development and the time course, so at six weeks, you're seeing everything looks even great. The callus now is, is turned from osteoid to more mature bone. That's the only difference. And the osseous bridging between the fragments appear to be complete. So the callus is basically turned into just bone. There's very little difference. Um, oh, sorry, now we're at 12 weeks, whoops. At, so at six weeks, you're seeing mature bone. At 12 weeks, basically, it's done. It's very impressive. So the osseous bridging between the fragments appeared to be complete. There was little histologic difference between the callus and the other contiguous bone. So basically, at 12 weeks, at three months, the bone is done healing. So if you ever had a question in terms of like fractures or how long does it take the bone to heal, the early bone healing, I would say somewhere around four weeks, maybe six weeks, and complete bone healing about three months. Anyway, so that was the seven surgeries where they attempted to preserve the greater palatine arteries. What about the three where they, they ligated it, they sacrificed it? Actually, so they found, and this is of course very interesting and has particular, particular clinical applicability to us today, so they found that the three times when they did ligate the arteries, there was no discernible effect on the perfusion of the radio contrast throughout the intraosseous, intrapulpal, or soft tissues. So basically it had no effect. The blood supply was thoroughly established based on the palate and based on the labial buccal gingiva. It was unnecessary to preserve the greater palatine. There was no difference. There was complete contrast in all the intraosseous, intrapulpal, and soft tissues. It made no difference. So I found that to be, of course, very interesting, and that's an important takeaway of this paper. A couple of things just to mention. Now, what are some of the limitations? There was, obviously, there's not a great number, only 12, 
it would be better if there were more. It was done on monkeys, not humans, okay? Um, these are obviously some limitations, but not to diminish, obviously, the importance of this paper. But I do want to just mention the limitations um, just for thoroughness. So one one deficiency is, even though they did free, fully mobilize the maxilla, they did not reposition the maxilla. The maxilla was put in the pre-surgical position. And of course, that may not be completely analogous to when we do it, we're moving the maxilla to try to change the patient's mid face deficiency. So that we're not just going to put it in the pre, pre-surgical pre position, we're going to try to advance the maxilla or down or we're going to move the maxilla in some direction, which will of course cause stretching of the soft tissue nutrient pedicle. And that may have a clinical effect. So that's one limitation of the study. And then secondly, I do want to mention, this is just this is not a limitation of the study, just kind of interesting. It helps me put in perspective, I guess, how hard it is to operate on monkeys. So they do mention, just as a side, as a practical matter, all of the greater palatine arteries may have been transected at the time of the surgery. So when I first read that, I'm like, what do you mean it may have been? Don't you know if you did or didn't? It said in the beginning of the paper, in theory, they tried not to. So I guess operating on monkeys with 10 kilogram and, and Reese's monkeys, obviously, if you've seen pictures of them, they have tiny little heads. So it's kind of like operating on a little baby. And it's quite possible that they were doing this in a lab. I've done some surgeries in labs and it's not the same as an OR. You don't have the same light, you don't have the same tools. You're often using like miniature versions of the tools that you would have in the OR. So it's quite possible that they just saw some bleeding back there and they're not quite sure if it was the descending palatine or not. So as a practical matter, they're not even quite sure whether or not they sacrificed the artery. They, in theory, attempted to preserve it in seven out of the 10 and they attempted to sacrifice it in three out of the 10. But for all we know, it was sacrificed in all 10. Would it make any difference? No, because the bottom line was, even when they did ligate it, for sure, there was no discernible, discernible effect. Anyway, so the bottom line from this paper, I hope you guys enjoyed it. This paper came out in 1975. Like I said, this surgery already, Obi Gazer in 1965 was saying to do this, but this surgery provided with the knowledge of the results of this investigation in animals, clinical total maxillary osteotomies can be done more aggressively and more confidently than done previously. So again, this paper was considered a classic paper because it provided the evidence and the support for the basis of the surgery, which until only just a few years prior, there was fraught with all sorts of dispute in terms of the different approaches. And after this paper came out moving forward, this became the accepted practice and the accepted, the accepted technique for a total one Lafort osteotomy. All right, guys, thank you. I hope to see you guys next time.